This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 796, recorded on August 20th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Depomier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Uh, it's a little gray out there. It's hot. It's humid. It's sticky. It's yucky. But did anybody see the moon last night? No. It was no. absolutely stunning, yeah. at, at least where I was. It was surrounded by haze. And then there was this crystalline halo that went around the whole thing which is uh, ice crystals in the, uh, I think it's the hmm. stratosphere. I'm not sure, but uh, maybe Rich knows that. Uh, when you see a halo around the moon, it means that there, uh, there's, well, it's capturing some refractory hmm. characteristic of the atmosphere, which was very pretty. We took our grandson last night to see an outdoor performance of the uh, Lion King, the movie by Disney Productions. And um, that was the first time I ever saw it. And uh, Jeremy Irons was... He turned out to be my favorite voice, <laughs> as well as Cheech, who played, I think he played one of the uh, hyenas, but I'm not sure. Also joining fun. us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 92 degrees. <laughs> Continuing with uh, what, for uh, by Austin standards, uh, in my experience at least, is quite a mild summer. I was just outside. It was actually quite pleasant. <laughs> and uh, so there you go. Yeah. In fact, I, I was, uh, I've had dinner with Rich on Tuesday. I was in Austin and I, fe I felt it was actually not as hot as it is around here on that particular day. Anyway. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's been, it's been quite pleasant. And um, Austin listeners will appreciate the fact that uh, Vincent and I went to the Texas chili parlor. <laughs> okay. And uh, experienced that an iconic <laughs> Boston restaurant. So I learned that Texas chili doesn't have beans. I didn't know that. Right. No, it's all meat. <laughs> they have Texas chili. Then they had regular chili as well. Yeah, it was a was a fun place. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, unsurprisingly, my weather is very similar to Dixon's. It's very gray outside, and a good day to stay inside and work on your syllabus. There you go. It's 27C <laughs> and really cloudy here. Really cloudy. Man, work on your syllabus. Mm -hmm. oh, God. Remember those That's days? That's what I'm up to right now. <laughs> we have two guests for you today returning um, multiple times from the Rockefeller University, Paul Binash and Theodora Hatsuanu. Welcome back, guys. Hi, y'all. Hello. Thank you for having us. One of those days where you're... Uh, Thankful for air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. We like your view, though, the plants. and Dude, Behind, behind you is the East River, right? That's right. Yeah. Maybe we'll see a boat go by at some point. Very oh, likely. Not. Very likely. They're always you know, going up I, and down. I, there's some really quite fall. impressive ones. Uh, <laughs> some of these uh, very expensive yachts and you Google them and you can rent them for $600,000 for a weekend if you like. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> nice. When I was there, I, I was in um, uh, Theobald Smith Hall, and our windows also overlooked the East River. And one day we looked out, and there was an atomic submarine making its way down the East River. Wow. Yeah. What the heck was that doing there? How do you know it was atomic, Dixon? Oh, you can tell. There was this, it had, it had absolutely no structure on the outside of it. It was as smooth as a long black cucumber with a little conning tower on the top. That was it. Hmm. It was wow. very ominous. Wasn't the thresher, ominous. was it? I hope not. <laughs> no, no, no. I wasn't not that old. <laughs> Although that, that went down in the early 60s, I think, didn't it? I, maybe maybe in the 60s. I don't remember when, but I remember it as a kid. I remember but hearing I was there in the 60s, so and that, seeing that, the blurry black and white photos of it lying on the, yeah, on the ocean yeah, floor. Very sad. sad yeah. day. All right. So today we're going to talk about um, antibodies and spikes, <laughs> right. which we talked about last time because uh, Paul and Theodora have done quite a bit of work with uh, looking at antibodies and, and neutralization assays and so forth. And uh, I met, I saw Theodora, we had dinner actually, I don't know, 
in July, right? It was July That's we had right. dinner. And Paul, yes. Paul was there as well. Yeah. And uh, Theodore, so we have this cool paper uh, we're going to submit. And um, so sh you actually put it up as a preprint because you said you weren't going to do that. But then came out as a preprint on BioArchive, High Genetic Barrier to Escape from Human Polyclonal SARS-CoV-2 Neutralizing Antibodies. So here we are. We're going to talk about it today. I think it's timely given everything else that's going on around uh, COVID these days. So um, what was the, you've been working on epitopes for the whole time, right? You've published quite a few papers on epitopes. You do the selection and, and resistance to antibodies and so forth. And you've mapped quite a few. You've actually identified them before they appeared in variants, right? <laughs> That's right, we did. Right, indeed. So, I'm, uh, what's it called? The Oracle from Delphi. <laughs> no, wait, I have another name for the couple now. They could be Tiresias and Cassandra. <laughs> In the old days, I mean the really old days, those were the two fortune tellers for the for the fate of the Greek and mm. uh, uh, Tro Trojan empires. But unfortunately, nobody believed them. So I Exactly. <laughs> they were cursed. Nobody so believed them. You've got a terrible burden on your shoulders right now to try to convince us what you've just done. <laughs> so let's talk about this paper. But first, so with the spike protein, this is the basis of many vaccines and antibodies against the spike can neutralize infectivity. Where on the spike are these antibodies binding in general? So that that in large part was what we were setting out to determine using in this in this paper. So um, sort of from the from the beginning of the pandemic, we and many others have been um, quite focused on a particular set of antibodies, those that target the, the receptor binding domain of spike, the, the bit that binds to ACE2. And many of those antibodies um, compete with ACE2 for binding to the spike and thereby uh, neutralize the virus. Um, but then they're clearly not the only neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what, this um, paper was really about was to try to set out in a, in as unbiased a way as possible to find out what the what the neutralizing activities are in polyclonal plasma plasma from people who have been infected or vaccinated rather than looking at specific particular types of antibodies that we know are neutralizing what's the what's the whole spectrum of antibodies that 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 can be elicited, and and that's that's important because if if antibodies are all targeting a single epitope, right? Even if you have a title of of a million, it can be that you can escape from from those antibodies with one or two mutations. But if you have say a hundred different antibodies, all targeting different epitopes, then you know one one mutation is going to make a negligible difference uh, in the terms of the sensitivity of of the virus to that that set set of antibodies. And so, uh, what we're really trying to do here is to sort of get some kind of handle on what those, in very broad terms, those numbers are. What are the the numbers of epitopes, what's the hurdle or genetic barrier that the virus would have to jump to escape most or all of the antibodies that it would encounter uh, in the course of mm -hmm. passing through a, a immunized human population. So mm -hmm. the, the monoclonals that are being used therapeutically, do they mainly target the, the um, RBD? Yes. Yes. Okay. Almost exclusively. Yes. And do you think that all neutralizing antibodies against spike block attachment, or do, are there other mechanisms? There, there clearly are other mechanisms. Yeah. Um, so there have been a couple of antibodies recently identified that target S2, so the, the fusion machinery, mm. extremely unlikely that they would block attachment. 
I think it's somewhat uncertain in the case of the NTD antibodies. That That's a, a bit of the spike protein that's right next to the hmm. receptor binding domain. So those antibodies can't directly compete for ACE2 binding, but you could imagine that if you have enough antibodies on a virion, they could um, sterically hinder the access of, of ACE2 to the, to the RBD uh, binding site. I don't think it's really known for, that, for those antibodies. Okay. But there's certainly a, 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 at least some antibodies that, that almost certainly wouldn't affect attachment. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm forgetting. Is the uh, N-terminal domain, what's the relationship between that and the bit of spike that flips up to engage the receptor? It's right next to it. It, can't, it depends. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if an antibody uh, impact uh, binding to the N-terminal domain might inhibit that movement, okay, and compromise infectivity. It's possible. Potentially, Absolutely. yes. Possible. Or, or subsequent structural changes required for the uh, envelope to mediate fusion. That's also a possibility. Yeah. Uh, the mechanism of neutralization of the NTD antibodies, I don't think has no. really been worked right. at all yet. So there was a, we did a paper some time ago where, I can't, I think it was, among the authors was Lin Fa Wang, and they had a, I think it was an antibody to a cryptic epitope, which broadly neutralized many variants and many Sarbeco viruses. Where is that? Is that on the NTD, that epitope, do you call? No, so the, the, I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular paper, but there have certainly been a couple of other papers where uh, antibodies sort of come in at the side of the spike. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit like you, there's, there are analogous set of antibodies for HIV and flu influenza that come in, come in at the side yeah. uh, and basically mess up the, the fusion machinery, the steps okay. after receptor binding. That, that part of the spike... Um, is is significantly more conserved among Sarabeco viruses, um, perhaps because of functional constraints, mm. and perhaps because it's not very often targeted by antibodies. Mm. Um, consequently, those antibodies have have broader activity. Unfortunately, they're not particularly potent. Yeah. They don't. Okay. You need quite a lot of antibody to neutralize. I remember the one of the experiments they did. They tried to make resistance and they could not. Uh, it was very difficult to do because I think the changes that might give you resistance were not compatible with uh, fitness. Okay. Now, in the first part of this paper, you, you actually look for evidence that the NTD does have um, neutralization determinants and you use SARS-CoV-1, right, to do that. T can you tell us, run us through those experiments? Though it wasn't exactly, it wasn't focused on the NTD. Let's say we're looking for non-RBD. So okay. Any, mm -hmm. Anything that binds outside the RBD. So what we did, and this was done, we started this work almost a year ago, uh, <laughs> was to take the RBD from SARS-CoV-2 and put it in the SARS uh, spike and vice versa, take the RBD from sars one and put it in SARS-2 and then have a panel of plasma and say what happens to neutralization when you have this, uh, the parental viruses and then the chimeras. And of course, the, the samples we used were all plasma that of, from people that were infected with SARS-CoV-2. We didn't have any SARS uh, plasma. And as one might expect, they neutralized SARS-CoV-2, but they didn't really have that great of an activity against SARS-1. And now when you swap the RBD, you see that, so if you have a SARS-1 where the RBD is from SARS-CoV-2, you now get plasmas that can neutralize this virus, but not all of the plasmas. And when you do the reverse, mm -hmm. in most cases, you actually uh, gain, also gain neutralization activity. So that shows you that you do have quite a uh, I would say significant amount of neutralizing activity targeting non-RBD epitopes. And in, a, I think, three plasmas, uh, it seems to be predominantly non-RBD. Uh, but there's also, so basically the experiment shows you that you have active, 
neutralizing antibodies targeting the RBD, but also a lot yeah. of neutralizing antibodies targeting non-RBD. I like that. It was a cute experiment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, if, if you'll uh, allow me, I'd like to take a little um, technical sidetrack in this. Okay, because the yeah, techniques of course, of course. Uh, techniques interest me. Uh, first of all, I have to say, I'm reminded of um, an interview that uh, Vincent did with Dashak that some of the anti-vax folks got a hold of, um, or actually some of the lab leak yeah, the lab leak, got yeah. a hold of, <laughs> um, and touted as evidence that, you know, they were creating monsters in a Wuhan lab where, in fact, um, uh, Peter was just, you know, describing experiments, okay, <laughs> that people do. And so I was thinking about that when I read this sentence. Uh, we compared the sensitivity of HIV-1 pseudotypes bearing parental and chimeric spike proteins in which RBD sequence was exchanged uh, between uh, SARS-1 and SARS-2. So I'm thinking... Some journalist gets a hold of this and he says, these guys are making SARS-1, SARS-2 hybrids and sticking them in HIV, okay? Uh, but it's a perfectly reasonable approach. As a matter of fact, it's a very powerful approach. So I'm interested in, um, uh, beyond that, uh, you also do um, uh, ex uh, use uh, VSV uh, as a... Uh, pseudotype. Okay, so in both cases, you have HIV bearing the uh, uh, SARS glycoprotein on the one hand, or VSV on the other hand. Uh, what's the difference? Why? Why? Why would you use one or the other? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so that they they are different. Um, the 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 VSV construct that we use is actually replication competent. Okay. So we we put we put the the gene for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein actually into the genome of uh, VSV. Okay. Um, in the case of the in HIV, we're expressing the the spike and the guts of the virus on mm -hmm. two different constructs, and what's packaged into the virus particle can't then be propagated. Um, okay. It's useful for doing a single cycle replication experiment, okay. but you can't use it to evolve resistance. Okay. The, the power of the VSV system is that you can generate genetic diversity in in a virus that's replication com competent, but in a background that is that is what we would call safe. So VSV is incredibly sensitive to interferon. Um, in fact, constructs like the one we've made have been injected into people as vaccine candidates. Right, um, sure. They don't work that well, it turns out, in this case. But but it, it's it's the VSV recombinant allows us to do genetic genetic evolution experiments without the fear that would accompany doing those experiments in bona fide SARS-CoV-2 itself. You can imagine people would understandably get a little upset if... Um, um, we tried to select antibody resistant mm. SARS CoV 2 in the lab. Um, so, uh, uh, the other question I have is uh, whether the expression of the spike protein on the surface of either of these pseudoviruses uh, is different and how that might impact the results. Because, you know, my uh, sort of uh, uh, primary school understanding of HIV is it has a fairly low density of its own receptor binding protein, whereas VSV, I think, is much more dense. And that density can uh, impact on uh, the behavior of binding and, for all I know, maybe even neutralization. So can you comment on that, whether it makes any difference? Uh, yes. Well, yes. I don't think that uh, the pseudo... In both cases, even though the virus expresses the spike in its genome, in the case of VSV, it is still a, su a pseudotyping. So you are decorating a particle that with a vi with an envelope that's normally doesn't belong to it. Right. And I'm not certain that the density of this different envelope mirrors the okay. natural envelope that the um, virus will express. And in the case of spike, this is a particular issue because it doesn't normally as the the 
coronavirus don't normally assemble at the plasma membrane mm-hmm. and don't pick up their envelopes from there. So we rely, I think, in part to uh, overexpression and truncating the cytoplasmic tail to get sufficient envelope comparison in both HIV and VSV. So in both cases, it's kind of you're pus- pushing the system in an uh, to a, an artificial degree. And uh, from at least from our experience, we don't see a big difference in neutralization activity of either plasma or uh, individual antibodies against uh, HIV compared to VSV. And we've compared them extensively with bona fide SARS-CoV-2. Okay. And we know that the data correlates very, right. very, very well. So it's unlikely that we'll see something that neutralizes HIV that has no activity against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and vice versa. So uh, we're pretty confident that at least when we're measuring neutralization, I'm not saying anything else, we are measuring uh, things that mean something. Okay, cool. I, Great. I'll Thank just, you. I'll just add to that, actually. What, what we've done more recently is because in the HIV system, we're putting two components into the cell to generate the virus particles, we can vary the amount of spike protein that we co-express with the HIV particle. And in so doing manipulate the spike density on the virion. And we've looked at how that affects neutralization sensitivity. And the answer is not very much. It does a little bit, but not a lot. So the next set of experiments you take, you have this collection of uh, convalescent plasmas, right? The Rockefeller uh, collection, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? (laughs) What's the right name? Uh, The Rockefeller... Are you 27? Are you 27? Are you 27? And there are 27 different patient plasmas, is that right? Correct. So each is an individual. And then you use that to select uh, from your VSV pseudotype some variants, resistant variants. So tell us how that works and what you found. Right. So that that was quite a long and arduous process, <laughs> actually. Um, so these these plasmas, these 27 plasmas were chosen for, for high titer, right? So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, our collaborators, Michelle Nussenswag, um, Christian Gabler, Marina Kasky, they recruited a, a cohort that we've been studying for, for the last year and a half. And these 27 were some combination of the first 27, first few dozen through the door and were selected for high titer because if you want to select resistance you're going to be struggling if you if you start with plasmas that are not Mm. very high titer so these were chosen to be potent and so for each plasma we well we made a a large diverse population of vsv with sars-cov-2 spike mix it with plasma and then try and grow virus that's resistant um, to that plasma. And we did 27 individual cultures, actually many more than 27 individual cultures because we did it at various dilutions of plasma because you're looking for the right concentration that doesn't completely kill the virus, Mm. um, but imparts some selection pressure so that you can see what the the predominant um, selective forces are in that plasma. And so the goal of the experiment is to have whatever the predominant antibody is in that plasma uh, for the VSV SARS-CoV-2 recombinant to generate mutations that confer resistance to those to those antibodies. So, is there usually so, is there usually a dominant antibody in in a plasma, a convalescent plasma? So that's part of what's interesting in the result. Um, the answer is sometimes. Okay. Um, Quite often, there's, there's, we'll find um, selection at a particular epitope uh, in the spike protein. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes we'll find selection at multiple epitopes, and sometimes we won't, can't generate resistance at all, um, suggesting that there are multiple multiple points of attack, and there just isn't a mutant in our population that can overcome that. Um, so in my mind, I'm asking the same question in a different, in an experimental way. Uh, for a given serum, if you do this selection multiple times, do you get the same answer? Or do you come up with different epitopes? Mostly. So we, so we, did, this, we did this in duplicate. So we, we had two separate populations of our diversified VSV um, population, and we did them alongside. 
and sometimes you get the same or some quite often what you'd have is say uh, you get a mutation at say position 444 in this plasma and a mutation at 445 um, with the other with the other virus pool so finding different solutions to the same okay um, and sometimes it would be different okay um, plus there's also there's also passenger mutations you know the, the because the virus mm. is is quite diverse um, you might be selecting for one mutation but there happens to be another mutation that comes along with it so you end up with a quite a set of sequences and this is all analyzed by next gen sequencing um, you end up with a somewhat diverse population of viruses after each of these uh, selection experiments sometimes dominated by one variant sometimes multiple variants and sometimes no change at all um, so it's quite quite a job to sort of deconvolve what's going on. Tell me. Go ahead, you go ahead. did this sort of relatively early, I would assume, in the pandemic, given that you did it about a year ago, you said? That's um, when we started, yes. Yes. So um, do you think that the specific isolate of the virus that infected these patients matters? And do you think that you'd see the same types of things if you did it at different times during the pandemic? No, probably. No, you're right. The, uh, the strain with, no, the variant with which the uh, people were infected almost certainly will influence what antibody responses they will produce. And uh, at least with the RU cohort, actually with all our cohorts, we are certain that they were not infected with variants, they were infected with the original parental uh, virus. And, uh, but even, so what Paul says is that you get this, uh, a whole panel of different responses, uh, changes or selection. But even in cases where there is what we think is a predominant based on sequence, so you identify the same mutation coming up over and over again, frequently what happens is you introduce this single amino acid change into the your spike, and then you say, oh, it has again resistance. And the results are always disappointing. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but <laughs> not really. So even though the, var the plasma seems to be selecting for this one escape um, amino acid substitution, the, the same uh, substitution by itself does not confer complete resistance to that plasma with which it was selected. Yeah. So, so that sounds to me like, that sounds to me like uh, acquisition of the mutation early in the passage gives that virus enough of an advantage so that it shows up, but it may be a pretty subtle advantage. Yeah. Something yes. like that. Mm. So, so, from from these 27 um, individual selection experiments, what we then did was to plaque purify from those selected populations virus variants that, that had apparently been selected. So we, we made, I think, 38 of those and then went back to the plasma and asked, how resistant are they? And as Theodora said, disappointing. Not very. Um, well, disappointing in a sense, um, the average was about threefold change in IC50, which is pretty modest. There was somewhere it's larger, somewhere there was no apparent change. Um, but um, but the point is, what that tells you is that each of those plasmas, um, the the dominant antibody in that plasma is of course being backed up by a whole set of other antibodies, and you you just can't overcome in most cases a polyclonal antibody response with a single or even two mutations. Which is actually great. So it was disappointing experimentally, but mm. good news for <laughs> vaccines. <laughs> now, in the end, how many how many amino acid sites did you identify that affect um, antibody binding and where, where were they located? So so that's that sounds like a simple question, but it <laughs> is. <laughs> so... so there, there's probably, um, if you look linearly on the spike protein, there's probably six or eight, what I would call clusters of mutations where mm -hmm. the selection experiment suggested that there are um, antibodies uh, targeting. Mm -hmm. um, but it, of course, there are, they are clusters, right? So they probably define... Um, an epitope or a set of ep overlapping 
epitopes, mm -hmm. um, which could be targeted differently by different antibodies. Sure. So um, the overall number of mutations is a lot greater than what you might think of as antibody binding sites, because there are obviously multiple different ways that you can, you can escape binding of, of individual antibodies. So what's your estimate for the total B cell epitopes on spike? I don't think I can answer that, to mm. be honest. Um, it depends yeah. how how you define one epitope as being different to another epitope. Mm -hmm. mm. So for the RBG, at least, we've classified the antibodies into four different classes based on what uh, on where they bind. But you, there are some individual residues affect slightly different needs. Sure. Antibodies, so you, it's it's overlapping, but not exactly the same. Yeah. You you get a sort of a, a different impression if you define these structurally versus functionally. So there, there's a major class of antibodies that target the the RBD, for example, the so so-called class two antibodies that that bind in overlapping where the ACE2 binding site um, is on the on the RBD. Um, some of those antibodies, if you make the, this famous E484K mutation, mm -hmm. um, some of those antibodies, you completely lose binding, okay? Mm -hmm. And you completely lose neutralizing activity. But there are other class two antibodies where the binding is very similar, but just a little bit different where the E484K mutation has almost no effect, mm. right? So do you call that a different epitope? Functionally, it it you know the effect of the mutation is dramatically different, but they're binding in sort of the same way. So this paper is really approaching this from a, a functional neutralizing type of approach, rather than classifying the epitopes in a structural way. So those two approaches, I think, give very different estimates of the number of epitopes. So there's. I have a very simplistic view because early in my career, this was done for polio virus. It was the beginning of monoclonals. And so people took monoclonals again. They made monoclonals against polio virus. They selected for resistant <coughs> variants. Each had a single amino acid change in a, in what on the structure was a clear epitope of what, 10, 12 amino acids, right? And you could get changes throughout it. And there were four antigenic sites on the particle. Very simple. <laughs> You know, and the monoclonals would bind to one of those four, and then, and one amino acid change would make resistance. So, much simpler than <laughs> how you yeah. describe it, but probably a, a consequence of the technology that was used and so forth. But it's not that simple, as you see. It's right. more complicated. It's nuanced, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, there's uh, quite a, a real abundance of epitopes in the N-terminal domain, uh, and I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about some vaccines that have been made that are just the receptor binding domain. And that strikes me as uh, missing an opportunity. I, but I don't know uh, sort of what the history of the efficacy of those vaccines is. Yeah, so, so the, the NTD, when you look at linear sequence, does look quite juicy and attractive in terms of um, epitopes. But then when you fold the thing up, you find that uh, a lot of those, um, what look like on linear sequence se separate epitopes, actually sort of fold together uh, into okay. what's called the so, NTD supersite. Yes. Okay. And so the, it's not quite as juicy as a vaccine okay. target as you might think. Interesting. But it's still still important. Still, I think if you look at figure two, that. Basically That's exactly what I'm looking at right yes, here. It describes everything which we're talking about in terms of linear epitopes versus their mapping on the structure. Yeah, and I can see I, mean, I can see now on the 3D structure what you're talking about. Yes. So, um, so in a couple of past episodes, we've talked a little bit about um, the contribution of non-neutralizing antibodies. Um, so can, do you think that there's any importance for the non-neutralizing antibodies here? Um, and have you looked at that at all? We haven't, mm -hmm. and our experiments would be blind to those um, antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, what we, it, it is true that there have been a couple of papers that have, have put 
antibodies that have no in vitro neutralizing activities into animal models and shown, shown a degree of protection. Um, so for sure, non-neutralizing antibodies can be useful. Um, it's also true, though, that if you have a potently neutralizing antibody, it doesn't necessarily have to act only by neutralization, right? So when, when you have a potently neutralizing antibody, one thing you can say for sure about it is that it binds tightly to a conformationally accurate spike protein that can be on a virus particle or it can be on an infected cell. Um, and so neutralizing antibodies, we like neutralizing antibodies because they neutralize, but they can also do everything in most cases that a non-neutralizing antibody can do as well. Um, so we and others have done some experiments where you take these neutralizing antibodies. This was done with Michelle and Ralph Barrick and Tim Sheehan's group down at UNC. You can take these cloned potently neutralizing antibodies and then you can make mutations in the FC domain that take away interactions with the FC gamma receptors, the 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 sort of the, the parts of the antibodies that would recruit the cells that would do things like antibody-dependent killing and so on. And what you get, what you find is sort of a mixed bag. Some of these potently neutralizing antibodies, they work just as well if you mutate all those effective functions away, and others work less well if you mutate those effective functions away. So, it, you know, neutralization clearly isn't the only function mm -hmm of antibodies, but but it's it's also a very important um, function of them. I hadn't thought about it that way, and I'm so glad that you described that. That's really helpful. <laughs> all, I, all I can think of, Ash, right now is a neutralizing antibody saying to a non-neutralizing antibody, everything you can do, I can do best. <laughs> <laughs> great. That's great. So you, you took the results of, of all of this, and you picked 13 changes from these and, and you put them all together, right? Mm -hmm. right. What's, what's the goal? What are we trying to do there? <laughs> uh, try and figure out whether we had mapped everything, whether our mm -hmm. selection experiments had indeed identified all the uh, antigenic target sites on the spike and what would happen if you really acquire yeah, amino acid substitutions in every single one of them. Would you obtain a spike that was... Uh, significantly more resistant than individual uh, mutations. Okay. So these 13 are what you think covers all of the epitopes on the spike? That's what we thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, when so, you yeah. So our, our thinking about this clearly evolved over the course uh, of the experiment. Yeah. Plus, plus with when we're doing these experiments, we're, we're thinking not just about... Um, uh, the end result, identifying all the mm -hmm. all the neutralizing targets on the spike, but also what what's a logical progression in terms of experiments, right? So so the our first attempt to generate what we call polymutant spikes, where we combine these mu mutations, they were based solely on the mutations that we got from these plasma selection mm -hmm. experiments, mm -hmm. right? So we pick thirteen that had the, the biggest IC50 uh, changes, um, things that were sort of spread out um, among the, the spike protein um, in an attempt to get something that would, would uh, have sort of synergistic effects when we, when we combined them. Um, the number 13, I don't, I don't even recall where that came from. Um, but the end, the end result was that when we combined 13 changes, we did get spikes that were, were more, more resistant than um, the individual mutations, but um, were somewhat, I would say, disappointing in mm -hmm. that they, didn't, they clearly didn't com confer complete resistance to these plasmas. Mm -hmm. It was clear that not every mutation that is a, a neutralizing target was identified in that initial screen of those 27 plasma. Well, that may be disappointing experimentally, but it uh, uh, provides comfort um, in terms of, you know, 
our ability to mount uh, a robust immune response. I also, uh, 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 a little side note that really interested me on this is that that virus, albeit it's a VSV uh, chimera, uh, carrying all uh, 13 of those was less fit significantly as I see it. Uh, than the, the one carrying the wild type virus. You got a one step growth curve here. Uh, I think you're jumping a little yeah. ahead, Richard. Richard, that's the one with twenty mutations. Ah, okay. Sorry. So I was, I was, I was smiling when you said um, <laughs> reassuring because yes, you're right. And uh, what Paul uh, uh, pointed out is we only did this with twenty seven plasma. But unfortunately, nature did the rest for us and uh, millions of people infected and the variants coming up. So True. when we yeah. when we got to this point with this spike, so that's when the variants started appearing. Mm -hmm. And we realized that some of the uh, selection pressures that appeared to be imposed on those variants, because I think we, we believe that a lot of the selection for these variants is driven by uh, antigenic pressure, uh, antibody yep. pressure. Mm -hmm. And they were not included in our poly mutant spike. So our selection with those 27 plasma did not identify all the sites. But as I said, nature did the experiment for us. And now we could, base, based on the variants that had appeared, identify additional uh, amino acid substitutions that uh, would contribute to um, plasma resistant. And that's the um, the 20. Uh, okay. The, the, yeah. the Polymutant spike with 20 amino acid changes that came next. Yeah. So when 13 didn't work, we did what Theodora had said. We looked at what nature had done, looked at what our plasma selection experiment had done. And we also, also in fact, went back to some of our monoclonal antibody selection experiments that we'd been doing alongside this over the last 18 months. And then put a fair amount of thought into... Um, what mutations would be likely to have the biggest effect for all the different classes of RBD binding antibodies, all the different places in the NTD that had been selected in the lab and in nature, and then a couple of other places uh, elsewhere on the spike where we suspected um, mm. antibodies might be targeting. And that, that was the, the spike that has a really high level of neutralization resistance. You, but you, also the fitness. Right. And, and the fitness also cost. at a fitness cost, right? Yeah. So in that case, the fitness cost comes probably because the spike is not folding properly in some way, right? And it doesn't allow attachment because that's the only the rest of the pseudotype shouldn't matter, right? Well, this is, is this right. VSV. Where is the yes, fitness cost? Yes. This is it, a VSV, right? Is it, yes, it's entire. It's spike dependent. I mean, you're talking about yeah, it's spike dependent. Yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah, so. yeah. It so it's it's about a log um, yeah. log in a single step growth curve. So it's it still grows well enough to do right. experiments on, but it, it's um, well, uh, it's clearly. We, I mean, what we what we have to bear in mind is that that this spike was made by scientists going through sequence and yes. making their best best guess as to what the optimal solution was, and you know we know that intelligent design is not. <laughs> as efficient as natural selection in generating yeah. these things, but um, so I, I mean, I, I'm quite happy and pleased that it worked as well as it did, and I, I am quite confident that if you gave this polymutant spike just a little bit of time to acquire second site mutations, you could get that fitness defect back quite straightforwardly. Yeah, but it probably like, in nature, it probably wouldn't have gotten to this point anyway. Yes. Most precisely. likely. Yeah. Precisely. So, so I can imagine why you wouldn't have looked in SARS-CoV-2, but did you see any differences in it in the HIV pseudotype uh, with the, the polybutene? Right. Yes, we did. And it, there's, there's a, an almost negligible decrement in pseudotype titer when you compare the parental and the PMS20 spike. We don't think that assay is particularly good at teasing out fitness differences because, you know, we can, we can manipulate those titers quite a bit yes. just by transfecting more or less plasmid. Um, the v VSV is probably a bit more discriminating because you've got multiple replication cycles. Um, 
But yeah, hmm. it it's clearly has some modest degree of fitness defect, but it it's absolutely a functional spike um, yes. with those 20 mutations. But I think as Paul mentioned, this is an important point. That is why I always... Uh, I want to say laugh, but at least smile when I see reports. Oh, so and so mutation affects um, ACE2 binding or affects titers by, I don't know, fivefold. And I, I never see that. And if I change my spike a tiny little bit, I never see effects of all these variants that uh, people mm. uh, report that have affect pseudotype virus titers. I'm not talking about bona f- actual SARS CoV 2, but when you're talking about pseudotype, you have to be absolute. I mean, there's so many variations that I don't think it's a appropriate assay to make uh, det- to determine whether your envelope is more or less functional in terms mm. of cell entry. Yeah. And pl- add to the fact that we're using uh, cell lines that overexpress the receptor, and you're nowhere near what the actual effects of these uh, amino acid substitutions have on the virus in a real system. So, I think it's worth emphasizing, as Paul said, you tried to design a virus to evade uh, antibodies and you made a mess of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> Just because when, when humans mess with viruses, that's what they do. As Paul said, nature is, is much better at uh, yeah. selecting yeah. what's appropriate because people out there seem to think we can make whatever we want and yeah. you can't. No, we're not God. No, 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 we're not God. We're, I would say we're not that smart. We're not <laughs> to make a, a, it's a, nature for a sure. virus better. I, well, I, you know, just to push back on that a little bit, I think we did okay. <laughs> no, it's not a criticism of you. I'm just saying it to, to deflect the criticism yeah. of people listening who are saying that you made a dangerous virus. You didn't. You made a mess of it. It does. It loses right. fitness. And I would say that fit, that tenfold reduction in fitness, it w- it would never compete against other other isolates yes. circulating. Yes. It would just lose. It, you would never see such a virus. So, no. yes, uh, your no. your experiments are gorgeous. No question about it. I just don't <laughs> want people to think that we can do. This is a great example. Whatever you do, you mess it up in some way. Yeah, but I, I also the the. A related point to make is that this doesn't in any way, you shouldn't in any way overinterpret what you just said to mean that the virus couldn't uh, find a solution to these to these antibodies. Okay. Um, we, we did it, we wrote down a sequence. First attempt, we got something that's a bit attenuated and fully resistant. Um, iterative selection by antibodies. Uh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. could reach the same goal, perhaps not with the same 20 mutations, but um, that doesn't mean that the virus couldn't do it or sure. is any way no, constrained no. from doing and, it. And I would I would go further and say the virus would do it more elegantly. <laughs> not to <laughs> yes. say that yours wasn't elegant, but nature does it always more well, elegantly. Definitely without yeah. the fitness course. Yes. Yes. Sure. yes. Well, and part of the message uh, is that there is selection for immune evasion going on yeah, in absolutely. these variants, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Every, every single one of those 20 mutations occurs naturally mm-hmm. and at some frequency. They yeah. just don't occur all together. You know, I think, you know, your work shows that many of these changes are likely selected by antibody pressure. But as Ron Fouché said, there's so many other changes in these variants something likely selected in other proteins, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. That, and that was actually a very good point. I, I, I completely agree. We are not, we are not, we are not talking about other proteins because we are obviously focusing on this yeah, yeah, and sure, sure. looking, using chimeric and pseudotype viruses. So all, all our conclusions uh, address spike, changes in spike. But yes, I completely agree that changes in other proteins could all, and sh- potentially do affect sure. I know they're much harder to sort out, right? Because yeah. here you have a nice neutralization assay and a pseudotype. Exactly. The others you need uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it's going to happen eventually, but it will take longer. Yes. Relevant to uh, the discussion that we've been having, and this is entirely speculative, I, I wonder whether some of those other non-spike mutations aren't uh, uh, mutations that compensate for a fitness cost in the spike mutations. Sure, maybe. Absolutely. That could be sorted out in the lab, right? 
Well, maybe. Yep. I don't know. Fitness in the lab is hard to correlate with in humans, right? Yeah, fitness right? in nature yeah. and fitness in the lab are two uh, night and day. I think at best you get things. some hints, but you never know uh, in the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, even though this uh, polymutant 20 uh, got around most of your plasmas, but you found something else with a different set of plasmas. Tell us about that. Yeah, so those are, so we, in addition to the RU27 cohort, we then also use what we call the random Rockefeller cohort, which is, again, people that had been infected early in the uh, pandemic in New York. And uh, we had s selected their plasma samples in randomly rather than uh, what we had done before for the selection experiments and tested uh, ability of the polymutant spikes to evade um, neutralization from those plasmas. And additionally, we, obviously had a now vaccinated uh, plasma for vaccinated individuals. And we chose, uh, we tried to match them in terms of neutralization titers between the convalescent and the uh, vaccinated and showed that in each of those uh, uh, groups of uh, plasmas, our polymutant spike, uh, the one with the 20 mutation, conferred a considerable degree of resistance for the majority of the plasmas that we tested. But then the last group of plasmas is the people that had been infected uh, uh, about a year uh, shortly after the pandemic hit New York and subsequently vaccinated. So vaccinated approximately uh, between six months and a year after the original infection. And what we had shown before um, in the previous paper was that the neutralization uh, potency of those uh, plasma samples is extraordinarily high and quite broad. So our polymutant resistance spike is not quite as resistant against mm. those plasma as it is against everybody else. And what we also uh, looked at, because we were, it was really uh, quite a striking difference, was to see are these plasma samples, do they have broad activity? So we tested them against SARS, uh, the first SARS. We tested them against uh, a couple of bat viruses and the, and the pangolin, I think, mm -hmm. yes. And remarkably, they neutralize everything. Mm. Not as well as SARS-CoV-2, particularly not in the SARS and the, the SARS-1 related viruses, but they do have uh, a quite a respectable, I would say, neutralize, neutralizing activity. So this suggests that you could achieve breadth against these any variant, potentially any variant, or any uh, future, perhaps, coronavirus, is what we have already, if you just manage to produce such a response uh, uh, with vaccination. Mm -hmm. And importantly, these people were infected with the parental uh, mm -hmm. strain, and then were vaccinated with the parental strain. So there was no need to uh, use variants or, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, pan-coronavirus vaccines, uh, so the, the breadth was achieved with just uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, original spike. So. so can you speculate on why that would be? What, what, it, what it is about vaccination of uh, a, an individual who's a convalescent individual, why that would give you breadth? And it's mm. even better than people who have two doses of vaccine, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So why is that? Yeah. So there's a, I think there's a couple of what I think are quite important points here. So we 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 think of, and then we see it in the press. People talk about two doses of vaccine as representing fully vaccinated, <laughs> right? What what um, this and other papers show is that two two mRNA doses, while very effective has in no way come close to exhausting the capacity of the human immune system to generate neutralizing antibodies to this virus or family of viruses. And uh, just to amplify on what Theodora said, the, the neutralizing titers of these plasma from people who have been infected and then vaccinated against SARS-CoV, those titers are as high as regular convalescent plasma is against SARS-CoV-2, okay? <laughs> so no, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. <laughs> so to get to uh, Rich's question about breadth, so th this actually gets to the nub of not just this paper, but another paper that we've, we've published recently. You can think about breadth 
in a number of different ways. One is, as we've addressed here, how many different epitopes are being targeted on the, on the spike and how many of those epitopes are basically the same in SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, just to take two examples of the sars viruses. If you sample enough epitopes, then you're more likely to hit on something that's conserved in the, in the two viruses. The other way to think about breadth is at the level of individual antibodies. And we've done that in, in other studies. So if you, for example, think about a, a class three RBD binding antibody that binds a specific epitope on SARS-CoV-2. Now, most of those antibodies won't touch SARS-CoV, right? The original SARS. But if you, if you let that antibody evolve, mature, do affinity maturation, so it binds tighter and tighter, it becomes much more tolerant, this binding becomes much more tolerant of sequence changes. And a subset of those antibodies, right, which started their life as being SARS-CoV-2 specific, don't touch SARS-CoV, let them mature enough, they can then touch SARS-CoV. And when you think about the breadth in these plasmas of people that have been um, infected and then vaccinated, it's got to be a combination of those two, right? You're sampling lots of different epitopes and then allowing the antibodies to affinity mature such that um, you, you generate a sufficient number and titer of antibodies that can react with the SARS-CoV, even though they've been elicited by SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. So the fact that if you take these individuals who have recovered from infection, you give them a single vaccine dose, you get this uh, great response. If you give them another dose, it doesn't get better, right? So, so all, the, all the patients in our study have had two vaccine doses. We, ha we haven't studied the mm -hmm. single vaccine dose convalescence, but my recollection from reading papers from yeah. other labs is that what you just said is correct. Yeah. That, so that would have... Uh, the, the at least at the level of plasma. Yes. Right. right. We haven't looked at... Right. So for, for these patients, we've actually looked at individual cloned antibodies and you, you can absolutely see the breadth, um, yeah. breadth coming over so time. So the implication is infection and one vaccine dose, is, that's, a, that's the best you're going to get. Yeah, uh, infection and uh, after six months, one vaccine dose perhaps. Yeah. Um, I would mm. just say it's the best we've seen. Yeah, yeah, of course, sure. Right? Doesn't necessarily mean it's the, the, the best you're going to okay, get. Okay, so here's the million dollar question. Yes. If you get three vaccine doses, are you going to get close to infection in one vaccine dose? Who knows? <laughs> That's what some people are saying, right? Yes. Um, so, so that 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 is a topic that's under investigation at the moment. Mm -hmm. We think that the the two vaccines and then a third shot might not be quite as good at, at generating breadth. Okay. That's that's really based on an analysis of antibodies that yeah. that have been elicited by two vaccine doses, and then you look months later. Those antibodies haven't broadened quite as much as the antibodies that were generated by infection. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's perhaps something to do with antigen persistence. Um, perhaps something to do with the way the antigens presented. Um, uh, and I don't want to overstate that conclusion because it's still being studied at, yeah, at sure. the moment. No, but also another important point, though, is that the maturation occurred after the boost. They did not, that the boost was absolutely necessary to see these antibodies, uh, even though they didn't gain as in breadth as much as after natural infection. You did need the boost. Yes, of course. Oh, the people so who are just immunized. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, I, ideally, you'd want to see what the antibody evolution looks like in people that had the third boost and whether yeah. there is further evolution. Sure. If there sure. is further evolution in individual antibodies, then you're going to, to the right direction, I right. think. And that would strengthen the argument for a third yeah. dose. So your, gen your, your, um, your first two vaccine doses aren't, aren't 
just generating antibody titers. They're also diversifying mm-hmm. your memory pool, mm-hmm. right? And so if you come with a third, hopefully it will pick from among the highest affinity of those memory B cells and amplify those. Um, but, you know, that that's, as I say, something that, that needs to be studied. How much do you think the timing of that uh, antigen exposure, that, that later antigen exposure matters? So I'm not so sure it matters in terms of, the, but it's my personal opinion, in terms of vaccination because of what Paul says, it said about the persistence of the antigen. So if it's only there temporarily, then and you given as much time as you have to the antibodies to mature, then waiting further is not going to actually help in terms of individual antibody maturation. All it will do is drop your titers further. In, in, in natural infection, it's different because clearly time does affect uh, breath. Yeah. So it, there's a- it is true nonetheless that even with vaccination, the, the memory B cells do continue to evolve after that second shot. So the, the, the memory B cell antibody sequences are more mutated mm-hmm. months later than they are Right They're after, right, after yeah. right, right after the boost. What That's that true. what that means in terms of antibody function, potency of neutralization, that still still out there. So it strikes me there's another interesting population of folks out there, and those that's uh, people who have been vaccinated and then got infected. Right, Are you yeah. leading them. Absolutely, <laughs> they're, they're 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 absolutely on the agenda. <laughs> yes. so, on our um, list. <laughs> And of course, they're becoming quite uh, plentiful uh, in recent weeks. The, of course, th- then you have another confounding variable because their 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 breakthrough infection is with a different viral sequence, right? right? So it's it's not it's not exactly the same experiment in reverse, right? It's a, it's a boost, for want of a better word, with a with what more than likely will be a delta uh, like sequence. Well, yeah. I've uh, I've been corresponding indirectly with uh, a um, vaccine hesitant individual who, uh, in fact, is uh, had COVID before, and is questioning why do I need to be vaccinated? And so, uh, with knowledge of this, I recently wrote him and said, "Dude, you get a superpower." <laughs> Okay. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what I tell them too. That yeah. doesn't often matter. <laughs> a lot of them don't care. All right. So th- the thing is, we're talking about neutralization here and all this discussion of the great antibody diversity you get after infection and a, and a vaccine boost. We're talking about neutralization, but in the real world, we're talking about disease. So as you know, neutralization titers decline. This one about. Three percent a month or so after um, vaccination, and you get infected. I wouldn't call it breakthrough. I think it's what all vaccines do. You get infected, but you don't get disease. And the vaccines still seem to be in the high nineties at preventing hospitalization, severe disease, and hospitalization. So the question is: Do we need this great superpower antibody? Because the T cells, which I suppose are mediating the protection against disease, are probably in the back there. And so what are your thoughts on that? Do you really, does anyone look at the T cells in these uh, infected and vaccinated people and uh, and see, is there a change in their functionality or are they already great to begin with after infection or vaccination? I know you don't do T cells, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, well. I, you know, for one thing, you know, it's it's often stated. I don't think with a huge amount of supporting evidence, though, that that T cells are what's protecting against disease and antibodies are what's protecting against infection. But even if you allow for that, right? Even if that that paradigm is exactly correct, mm-hmm. right? What, what the goal of vaccination is, of course, the primary goal is to prevent people getting sick and dying, right? But the, the secondary goal of vaccination isn't just to protect the, the vaccinee, it's to protect all the people um, with whom they come into contact. And right now, you know, somewhere around between a third and a half 
but depending on where you are in the United States, our population is not vaccinated. Okay, so I. I still think that it is a worthy goal to try and reduce um, not just the number of people in the hospital, but also the number of people who can put others in the hospital by becoming infected themselves. And then we get into this sort of murky, um, I think still being worked out phase of how, how, how infectious are people who have been vaccinated and then get yes. get infected? Okay, I think it's pretty clear they're less likely to to become infected. And if they are what I like to call chain terminators, transmission chain terminators, that that of course is a win. But if they they have been vaccinated um, at a lower rate, become infected, um, and then there's quite a bit of evidence out there that their viral loads are not substantially lower than those of the unvaccinated. It's quite likely that a significant number of those are infectious to others. So if if the goal of vaccination is to reduce that um, part of the transmission chain, then I think boosters um, are useful. But There's I, a study from Israel just recently that suggests that um, if you just measure infection by PCR, to put disease to one side for a minute and just think about PCR positivity, a third shot was 86% effective compared to two shots in preventing infection. Now, if that translates into transmissibility, then hmm. uh, I think it boosters makes sense if your only goal is to keep people out of the hospital then yes you spread the spread the two dose vaccine as widely as you can and use those boosters to ship to another country and and protect that population um, but that that i think is not the only goal of vaccination well, and, it, and it, of course this is all in a background where we have a, a third of our countrymen who won't take a vaccine yeah that's the the absurd part if we just would vaccinate more people this wouldn't be an issue but paul right. I, I i really don't see the evidence that vaccinated people are transmitting the viral rna loads are really not informative and as you may have seen this study out of Singapore. It's quite clear that viral RNA lo loads decline very quickly uh, in a vaccinated versus a non-vaccinated person. So I'm not sure that they are transmitting to a significant extent. And as you probably know, most human vaccines, viral vaccines, do not prevent you from getting infected, but they most likely prevent transmission. So I think this is in line with uh, all of the other vaccines. They prevent disease. The polio vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting infected, but it prevents you from getting polio. And that's why we originally did the, the vaccine trials with the endpoint at preventing COVID. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure that a, a booster makes sense unless, as we discussed before, it makes you have a broader antibody response. But then again, if uh, I, I, I don't think you're ever going to be unable to be infected by this vaccine. You are always going to be infected. Uh, and, and it's just a matter of how severe the disease gets. Um, Theodora, what do you think? I, I suspect you may have a, a different opinion. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. So we don't always agree we on that. It's okay. <laughs> and we have very interesting dinner conversations. And, uh, Let the, the um, speak. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, I mean, there's there's um, multiple considerations. Uh, in in terms of what you said, in uh, in terms of breadth uh, and whether we need a third, we really need a third booster. It depends. First of all, that will depend on what the next variant looks like. So, if you have a variant that's even more resistant than the current circulating mm -hmm. one. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you get to something that resembles our PMS twenty, then I would take three, four, five doses if you give them to me, I, because that actually has the potential to really become a breakthrough infection or really cause, increase the, um, both the, your possibility to progress to disease, but also to transmit. Uh, in terms of transmissions between vaccinated individuals, 
Uh, yeah, it's again, it's kind of difficult, particularly if people are not, as I think is, is not being done systematically measure asymptomatic infections in vaccinated individuals to know what percentage of them are actually getting infected, what percentage of them are transmitting. We know from anecdotal evidence from, from people that we know that vaccinated people can infect other vaccinated people. It's, they can transmit it. It's not completely, hmm. they're not, it's not impossible. Uh, but again, for the boosters, as I said, it will depend on what they do to the evolution of the antibodies. As for the protection against infection and the data from Israel, I would say that, yes, right now. So this is very shortly after the third boost. Yes, very shortly after the boost. Fantastic. Very shortly after the first boost. Yes. It was fantastic. Yes. What happens down the line? And will we have to take a booster every six months to right. achieve this 86% of protection from infection? I don't think that's feasible. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I don't think that we will need to take a booster every six months. I think that that third shot will... You might then be able to say people are fully vaccinated. Uh, yeah. You simply can't after after two doses. Well, to me, that's one of the, the, the what comes to mind is what we talked about before: getting vaccinated and then getting infected. Okay, right. uh, we've talked about this before about the notion that you know you uh, get enough of an immune response from a vaccination to prevent you from uh, dying, and then uh, over time you get boosted all the time just naturally because the virus is around, and that but may the, be. But but what the the point of contention and uh, what Vincent mentioned is is really pivotal. If you if you get vaccinated, right, you get infected, and you have a mild disease and you don't transmit, that's absolutely a win, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then there's no reason to give uh, any further boosting. You would just let the infection do the boosting. But I, I, I'm not certain that that is true, right? We, we still have to, I think, wait and see because remember these, um, these immune responses are still waning, right? What's it going to be like in December, January, February when we're all clustered together in our holidays, um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and it's been 10 months since we had our had our second dose. Um, first, is this is transmission among vaccinated people going to be quite frequent? Um, plus, I don't think we know at this point um, when the vaccine immunities wane significantly if this um, really robust ability to keep people out of the hospital is going to be maintained. Right? We don't. We just don't know these things at, at, at this point. But, but as you know, Paul, antibodies, anti-cells always wane, and it's we depend on the memory response to restore protection. And so right. it, when, when they wane, you're going to be infected, and then you have a memory response within a few days that protects you. I don't see how we can make a vaccine that does anything differently. We're never going to maintain high serum levels mucosal levels of antibodies that are enough to protect you against infection. There's only one right. example, right? The HPV vaccine. And I don't understand why that does that. So I don't mm. think I don't think any vaccine can can have that high a bar. You have to depend on in fact you said this at the last time you were on, Paul, that the antibody levels decline such that you will be infected. And then in two or three days the memory response is sufficient to protect you. And that that's how it works for the vaccines, right? And if this vaccine doesn't work well under those conditions, then it's not a good vaccine, but I think it is pretty darn good. Yeah. So I, I do think the situation would be different if we had already achieved um, population immunity, yeah. right? Yeah. If we didn't have a third of our population who are, are vulnerable, and then, then I, I would absolutely think differently about this. And then we'd be into a phase where we just basically have to, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure about that. Do what, Once we are vaccinated to the fullest extent possible, right? 
do we simply let the virus run its course and maintain immunity? Or do we have boosters every year or two to, to keep, keep viral pre prevalence at a, at a low ebb? Because if that's the end game, then there's no reason not to boost now, right? If, we're plan if we think we can keep this virus at a low level by, um, by vaccination, then absolutely it makes sense to boost people's immunity in the, in the near future. Um, if, on the other hand, we're envisaging a situation where we're, we're like the common cold coronaviruses, where we have a background level of immunity, R is about one seasonally mm. fluctuating with just mild disease and immunity maintained by infection, then you're right. It, there's there's no, no real sense in, in boosting, boosting people at this point except to protect the people who haven't yet been infected or vaccinated. Um, bottom line is everyone's going to be infected or vaccinated at some point. And yep. the question is how we get to that point. All right. So about yes. a month ago, uh, if you listen to CNN and other uh, August news services rather than Fox, uh, you heard from the experts that 99% of the people who were in the hospital had not been vaccinated. Are you right. still hearing that? Yes. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm not sure it's 99%, but it's it's a significant, it's significantly high number. Yeah. So the number hasn't changed, although if you go to the other August news service, which I check every morning, Yahoo News, because I appreciate the humor in um, <laughs> maliciousness sometimes. Uh, it's possible that I, I read a report this morning that said that 30% of the uh, LA hospitalized patients right now are breakthrough infections from vaccinees. Wow. That can't possibly be right. So this must be from the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, one point that we didn't uh, touch upon is that all these uh, discussions about boosters and second dose and potentially third dose is we're talking about mRNA vaccines. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is still, a, at least in the US, a significant portion of the population that has received a single J and J dose. I was going to say something about that. So too. <laughs> to me, at least I think the first thing we should do is boost those people. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I know we don't know how their antibodies are, have evolved or, or, but I cannot think that they wouldn't be the first to need at least a second shot. If we have seen what the boost mm. does to the evolution of individual antibodies in the mRNA vaccine. So, uh, yeah. The other issue, of course, is, and I, I, I honestly don't have a good feeling about um, what we're being fed through the media as being accurate or inaccurate is, is, is supply, right? So there are some places in the world that are barely vaccinated. And uh, whereas in the United States, we, if we could easily vaccinate everybody, if only they would, they would show up. Um, that, that, is a, that is another issue. And of course, um, you, that becomes really, really quite complicated because if you think of this at, on the individual level, if you have a, limiting num a limited number of doses, right, and you have, let's say, 85-year-olds um, in an old people's home in New York, right, who are vaccinated nearly a year ago, their, their immune responses are waned, right? They could still end up in the hospital if they're, if they're reinfected, right? So do you put your limited resources on boosting those people or do you send those doses to, let's say, Kenya, where 1%, 1 or 2% of people have been vaccinated? But that population has a completely different age distribution Hmm. They have very few 85-year-olds in Kenya who, who, who are at elevated risk of, of, of getting serious disease. So these, these are not straightforward, simple questions when you consider it at the level of individual people rather than as well as in groups. And the fewer of the people we vaccinate, of course, the more likely it is that there'll be other more deadly variants than we already see, right. uh, like, for instance, the Delta. How many letters in the Greek alphabet? <laughs> why do <laughs> you enough. say, Dixon, why do you say more deadly? What's the evidence for that, Dixon? Well, I think 
No, well, maybe I misspoke. Okay. Uh, all I'm saying is the prediction is. The oh, well, prediction. Is, forget you, the prediction. You no, know. Forget the prediction. It's the fear. It's the fear. <laughs> well. Wow. Right? You're dealing with fear here. Okay. Well, and that's I'm really, what Paul was saying. You're dealing with fear because how do you know that if you distributed all of our leftover vaccine that nobody wants anymore to Kenya, that you'll lower or affect the way people are dying and living? Do you know that for sure? Yeah, well, I mean, look, Dixon, actually, it's a good point because there is a paper we're going to we're going to have the people who did it. There's a theoretical paper it was published in Science in the past few weeks, which models what would happen if wealthy countries gave vaccine to poor countries. Right. And it makes we're a doing that already. What are you talking about? Yeah, we're but not enough. That. Not enough, Dixon. And th it has it can have a substantial effect on many aspects, including circulation, which you know selects for variants, and so. I think well, yeah. it's important to, to distribute it, and yeah. um, but I, I but the most otherwise. to me, we have to figure out how to vaccinate more than fifty two percent of the U.S. You can't I, force them, though. You can't I'm not force saying them. force them. Can we figure well, it out? <laughs> how many times do you have to tell somebody if you don't get this vaccine, you're going to die? Well, how many times do you have to say that? And they've said that. I mean, a lot. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, I know. So, so, so when. Sorry, go ahead. Bro. I would uh, I rather die than give in to the Democrats. Come on, get out of here. I, I, I would just say that I'm really glad that this is coming up and that Paul mentioned um, some of these trade off issues. Uh, because when I've been talking to some of my friends who are not scientists who've come to me asking about some of these booster issues, they've wondered if because there's debate and we are we're getting at exactly <laughs> some of the scientific issues, that one side is that the booster is dangerous or that there's you know, that's what the negative is. That's why we're saying no boosters. And that's why there's a, something against this. And so I'm really glad that we're getting into the actual scientific reasons or the actual pu public health, perhaps is a better phrase here, reasons why we're, we talk about the pros and cons here. There's, for you as an individual, there's nothing that would be bad if you got no. that booster. But there are reasons why policy-wise uh, we can talk about if it's good or bad to get those boosters. I mean, we have these same arguments about influenza virus vaccines every year, right? Vincent and I went to our local vaccine vaccine center at the university and got our pictures taken with us being vaccinated. You know how many times I've gotten the flu vaccine? About four times. That's about it. Why? Because we've become blasé about flu. You know, 40,000 people, 20,000 people are going to die from it every year. And that's, I mean, you just accept it, you know? And, but you've got a vaccine that might prevent you from dying. Why didn't I take it? I mean, I'm a, well, I won't go that far, but I, <laughs> I won't tell you what I think of my own intellectual capacity here. But I mean, I've sort of shrugged it off because I, I, I never got involved in a flu epidemic that had a lot of people around me that were actually getting sick. And I was starting to worry about that. And, but, but this is different. Yeah. This is totally different. I mean, you can say everybody knows somebody who's died from this already. I think we have to think very seriously about sacrificing some of our personal liberties for the for the greater good. Um, you know, New York schools, for example, this is a pet peeve of mine. There are mandatory vaccines to send your kids to New York public school that include right. polio, um, diphtheria. When was the last time somebody, a New York school kid died of mm -hmm. diphtheria or polio? Right, We vaccinate children, right, who are at neg individually are at negligible risk from dying from those diseases. And if we have mandatory vaccines like that, it makes zero logical sense <laughs> that right. SARS-CoV-2 is right. not on that list of mandatory vaccines. Yeah, I've actually been corresponding in the last day with the uh, chair of the the school board for the largest district in New York City and I'm going to argue strongly that we should be mandating um, vaccines for basically for everyone who's eligible applying whatever leverage we can because I mean, we have to we, there has to be an off ramp for this um, and whether it the only way is to basically maximize population immunity um, and then go back to normal normal living in so far as is possible. At this point, we don't know what the clinical footprint of the virus is going to be once everybody's immunized. We suspect it's going to be a, a fairly mild mild infection, but um, you know we 
with we can't go on with third to a half of our population not being immunized. It's just ludicrous. Well, New Zealand's a great example there, Paul, because they just shut down again. They just had a recent outbreak. I mean, they had some people that snuck in with fake IDs or something uh, that had been yeah, vaccinated. They have, but very, they, been. they have very few cases and they shut down. I think. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're <laughs> hypersensitive it's, to it's this. It's not happening so. here. Every every country is different. Um, oh, you're right. But, right. but uh, the, the, I, I still think the issue is, is getting uh, more people vaccinated. But let's say we can't do better than 55% two doses or whatever in the U.S. Many, how many seasons of infection do you think it will take before the, the remainder of the population is uh, immunized by natural yeah, infection? That's a great question. That's a great question. Have, any, have you thought about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Why yes, are you laughing? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, but it, it's a real, it's, yeah, that's it what's going to happen. Right? Yeah. I mean, no. and the bottom, the bottom line is one one infection is is only going to do it temporarily for a large fraction of people, and then they'll get a second infection. Mm -hmm. What's the clinical footprint of the second time you get yes. infected? Yes. And oh, you're going to have to wear masks to accommodate these people five years from now because they haven't been infected yeah, a second yeah. time. Actually, that would be uh, uh, an interesting uh, sort of uh, public health, public relations campaign to get a modeler to address that very question and say, how many more surges are we going to have to have? Yeah, maybe okay, Jeff, Jeff Shaman would probably do before that. Before yeah. we have, uh, through natural infection, uh, population level immunity. I mean, it could drag on forever. I think that, it can be a while, that, yeah. That actually, that could even uh, maybe convince people who are ideologically against uh, uh, vaccination just because of the impact on the economy. From having yeah, to go through sure. all of this crap for an extended period of time. Well, as you saw, the increase in cases in certain states was accompanied by an increase in vaccination rate, right? It went back up right. to a million doses a yeah. day, which That's you know, true. That's is true. unfortunate that that has to be the incentive. But maybe every time there's a surge, we, we get more people to be vaccinated. Actually, one of the most interesting thing for me, at least, that's going on right now, that this, is, this doesn't have to do with... Uh, vaccination, but it has to do with sort of public uh, perception, mm -hmm. uh, is the pushback uh, on masking, mandatory masking in Texas. Yeah. Okay? yeah. yeah. Uh, because the, the governor has said that you cannot mandate masking. Just uh, and now in many of the major uh, urban areas, all of the school systems has said, uh, no, we're just going to go ahead and mandate masking. I don't care what you say. Uh, and it even now has gone, first time this went to the Texas Supreme Court, the Supreme Court um, uh, ruled in favor of the government uh, governor, but now it's gone back again. And I don't quite understand uh, the genesis of that. And this time the Supreme Court says, no, we're not, we're not hearing this. Hmm. Okay. So it's interesting. Hmm. It's almost like there is a, a, a uh, 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 a public uh, mass pushback against mm -hmm. the ideology that won't mandate masks. Now, if exactly. the same thing could spill over into vaccination, the teachers and maybe it will eventually. They don't want to get sick. They don't want to yeah. go to school and go home and die. They they want to keep teaching, and in order to do that, everybody has to be safe. And right. the two states that you come from, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. Rich, I can't help but notice that you've been to Florida almost all your life, and now you're in Texas. <laughs> and you've got two of those governors that if you put them together, you couldn't tell them apart. So do you think do you think that your governor in Texas right now, because he's got uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, is going to come out because he's going to now advocate for the vaccine? And uh, uh, the vaccine? That would be really interesting. He's dug in awfully deep. Well, okay, yeah. so but he was six feet. I hope very deep. <laughs> Dixon, he was vaccinated. He was vaccinated. Dixon. He was vaccinated. He tested. Uh, uh, he tested positive. He doesn't have any symptoms. Of course, yeah. they jumped jumped on him right away with Regeneron. Yes, okay. exactly. So, <laughs> I mean, no, uh, Dixon. What uh, you you pointed out correctly? What those two states have in common is me. Okay, so I think uh, it's, it's really probably fault. my Coincidence? Fault. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. No, but what I, what I wanted to add, uh, because you mentioned schools, is that at this point, and uh, yes, of course we can debate the theoretical, and at, at what point do you stop 
caring about the next wave and at some point uh, you will have to go to uh, some form of normal living, whatever that is. But right now you have a, a, a large part of the population, the kids below 12, that where the vaccine has not been approved yet. Correct. And I don't see how anyone can discuss dropping measures such as masks and social distancing here, here. before everybody has the opportunity to get the vaccine if they want to. Here. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. What do you mean? It's just sacrifice Correct. the young kids because you can't be bothered to wear a mask? This is ridiculous. Or yeah. you were making a statement about your politics, and that's even worse. That's yeah. Even worse. No, we... In beginning September 13th, when the kids go back to school, we're going to be um, starting a grand experiment in um, viral mm -hmm. transmission. Mm -hmm. When all the schools go right. back, we'll have something like less yeah. than half of the 12 to 18s vaccinated and none of the under 12s. Yes. Uh, they'll be wearing masks. But there are certain New York politicians who are agitating for the mask mandate in schools to be removed. That's How right. dare you put a, a mask on my little um, child? Um, and it, the New York's a, it's a unique environment. There's, I'm not sure there's any place in the world that has this density of school children, parents, and grandparents mm -hmm. uh, with a patchwork of um, vaccine levels. Um, you know, only half the people in the Bronx and Brooklyn are vaccinated, uh, more like 70 odd percent in Manhattan. I have no. No idea what's going to happen this upcoming uh, winter well, season. You have some schools that have already opened in other places that have mm -hmm. already had bad things happen. Yes, exactly. Why, why isn't that a sentinel animal for everybody else? Don't do what they did down there. Let's do this. That doesn't translate. I don't understand that part at all. You know, uh, I don't get it. Daniel Griffin says, if you think wearing a mask on a, a kid wearing a mask is traumatic, have them go to a hospital. It's even more traumatic. Exactly. exactly. You know, his argument is, oh, it's traumatic for my kid to wear a mask. It's horrible to be in a hospital wow. for a kid. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I'm sorry to go back to, to uh, antibodies and epitopes, I, but I had one question <laughs> I wanted to ask before we, before we move on to uh, um, picks. So from my uh, view, and, and you, this could be wrong, this E484K change, um, this, in, in, a, in a paper I recently read, I don't remember which one, it seems to have the greatest impact on neutralization by convalescence here compared with all the other amino acid changes in the other variants. Is that, is that correct? Is, do you see similar resistance in your studies? I assume you've had 484K in there. Um, so it did it did come up in a plasma selection experiment mm -hmm. and it 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 is absolutely the case that it is one of the the first mutations that that comes up to the what I talked about earlier the class 2 RBD mm -hmm. binding mm -hmm. neutralizing antibodies which are a, a very commonly elicited uh, class of um antibodies uh, they they and they're quite they're common in part because they're very close to, to germline sequence. Ah, I see. The, part of the germline sequence actually binds with the R RBD very efficiently. Yeah. So they're yeah. among the most potent of the initial wave of antibodies that the virus would have encountered mm -hmm. as it passed through the human population. Now, that, 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 that your conclusion, your statement that E484K of all the single amino acid mutations might be the most pervasive in terms of conferring mm -hmm. plasma resistance. That certainly was true. Mm -hmm. I'm a little less certain that it, it, it would be true now after a lot of antibody maturation has gone on. So antibodies evolve just like virus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it certainly does confer resistance, some level of res resistance to some plasma. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cause high level resistance to most plasma. So I think a, an important message is that not all plasmas are equal, right? 
Oh, oh definitely. absolutely. And that, that's actually really, really important because, you know, if the virus is encountering the same antibodies time after time when it, as it goes from mm-hmm. person to person, uh-huh. that's, a, that's a sort of trivial um, resistance problem. But if it's encountering different antibodies as it goes from person to person, that's tougher, right? Um, and that's probably why you need 20 mutations to get mm-hmm. um, resistance to most plasmas. So is everyone's plasma slightly different or are there groups? Or can you group them together? I would, I would rather call it um, many shades mm-hmm. of a color okay. rather than discrete colors of a rainbow, for example. Or is it not gray? <laughs> so in, in, in effect, the, the, the different antibody responses in the popula- at a population level is a survival mechanism because, as you said, it allows uh, a, a change that arises in one person to not wipe everybody else out. Right. Right. Yes. That is certainly part of it. Yeah. It's kind of like T cells, right? Where they're, everybody has a slightly different MHC and that restricts uh, epitope presentation. So if, so if a T cell epitope changes in one person, it doesn't mean much to the next person, right? It may, um, maybe. Absolutely. Abs- I mean, I, mean it's, I think it's pretty well known that infectious diseases do, do well in homogeneous populations yeah. where, yep. where everyone's got the same MHC. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. You know, our antibody repertoires, and, and actually it's with Michelle, it's something we've studied in quite great detail. You have, you make a panel of antibody clones from a bunch of individuals. Some of them are identical, mm-hmm. right? And some of them are completely different. Yep. It's the, uh, it's the ones that are identical and that are selecting the common mutations like E484K. Mm-hmm. And it's the ones that are, that are different that are sort of giving this sort of broader yeah. broader level of neutralization. So looking at all the <clears throat> changes you've seen in your selections, do you can you see the next E484K? No, we no, can't. Nothing. We can we can I would say that well, we we spent most of our effort on RBD and just about every RBD mutation that's appeared in a variant of concern we've seen in a monoclonal antibody selection experiment. Mm-hmm. But that's a very different thing from be, us being able to say what's coming mm-hmm. next. I mean, we, ha- we have a list of mutations that we've seen, and there's a couple on them that haven't yet appeared in, okay. appeared in a, a variant of concern. Let's, let's say uh, K444. If that comes up in the next couple of weeks, you can say you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Only in Las Vegas would that come up. <laughs> let's do, uh, let's wrap this up with some picks. Uh, before, so we should, I also want to mention that this, uh, this work and this particular selection that I've been working on it for a year was uh, really spearheaded by two of our postdocs, Yiska and uh, Fabian. They really, uh, did all this and uh, my three techs Magda, Eva and Justin helped out with a lot of the neutralization experiments so yeah this this is a really pretty tough labor intensive um, piece yeah. of work actually uh, Theodora did you did you do some of these experiments too uh, the figure one with the chimeric SARS uh, yeah. viruses, because they were done uh, a long time ago I did those together with Justin yes okay. <laughs> oh yes I did that that well, figure <laughs> it's more I know you used to tell me you used to love going in the lab and doing these neutralizations. It was very exciting. Oh, for you, right? I'm going back. I'm going to go back in the, in the fall. I'm actually going to start. I, I plan to work with the real virus. I'm going mm-hmm. to get my BSL-3 training and Wonderful. do some, my, some right. real virus right. cool. experiments. That's exciting. Yes. Okay. Dixon, what do you got for us this week? Well, um, I picked something a little off the normal track of our uh, discussion. Uh, it's the National Ignition Facility. <laughs> and the National Ignition Facility is located at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in California, associated with Berkeley University, uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Audits. And they are involved in fusion reactions. Of course, they're, they're incredibly interested in developing uh, more efficient nuclear weapons. Uh, and they state that as one of their main goals. But 
in doing so, they've enlisted the help of lasers to generate enough pressure on a small object which contains the uh, isotopes hmm. of hydrogen. And the size of the, the object that they're trying to fuse is smaller than a BB. All right, get this now. And they've got lasers, 197 of them, focused in all directions towards the center of this little BB. Each laser is about the size of three football fields. Listen to what happened. They generated enough energy to fuse hydrogen, an isotope of hydrogen. They didn't say which one, but I presume it's either deuterium or tritium. There's only two I know of. And the generated amount of energy from that small little BB size object was, get this, you're sitting down for this now, 10 quadrillion watts of electricity. 10 quadrillion? I don't even know how big that is, right? However, before everybody gets excited about this, the entire burst of energy lasted for 100 trillionth of a second. <laughs> so while it was a lot of energy, you really couldn't put it to much use, but they almost broke even in the amount of energy that the lasers needed to make that happen. So they are nearing the equivalent point, as they call it. The moment they go over that, this becomes the way to generate electricity for the world. Hmm. Except that I can't imagine how awkward it would be to situate one of these laser facilities near a city. I mean, it's big. This is a big thing where it needs lots of backup. And you talk about three technicians, they probably need 300 technicians just to well, you know, make sure it's first, all lined up perfect. And I, the, but first I was computer, this. the first computer took up a whole room and didn't yeah, do no, squat. Yeah. Now you got one in your pocket. <laughs> it was by the Navy. The, it was by the, the first Navy. hydrogen bomb took up half an island. Okay. That's true. And yeah. now you've uh, got uh, oh, right. many times that in a small warhead. I have no doubt about that they can um, downsize and still maintain functionality. But this, just the announcement alone was fascinating enough. But then to do the research and find out that the article is, is in press, so they haven't really talked about it yet, except for the result. They felt that they could be sure about the result. But the article itself was excerpted. And they didn't say even which isotope of hydrogen they were using. Hmm. I had to look that up from some other resources that were doing similar experiments. But a t 100 trillionth of a second. Mm -hmm. Vincent, is that uh, shorter than it takes a virus to repl replicate? It's much shorter, yes. <laughs> much, much shorter. The stoichiometry of that is absolutely yes. stunning. Cool. <laughs> wow. I think this is going to really happen, Dixon. Well, they do. They do. That's huh? the point. Right. I don't have a, an opinion on this. That's what I'm going to be pushing daisies by the time it happens. <laughs> well, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Cool. If you All are, right. then I'll be down there with you, kiddo. We'll be uh, circulating our atoms once again into the universe. Gee, on that cheery note, uh, <laughs> Brienne. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of cheery, I have a video um, of a song people wrote about PCR called mm. the PCR <laughs> song. Um, it is uh, so it's a two minute long video um, that's on YouTube. Um, it was done by a group at BioRad. So, at the very end of it, they will try to sell you a PCR machine. Um, but it's just really funny. Just to see them kind of very seriously singing about PCR, um, I would watch out because the song gets really caught in your head. Um, oh. And it, it's just fun. Hmm. Um, and so oh. since we talk about PCR and using it for detection a lot, I thought people needed a PCR song. That's great. Cool. Very cool. Rich? Uh, so I have <clears throat> picked videos, excuse me, <clears throat> from Boston Dynamics a couple of times before, and I just All can't right. get enough of this. So uh, my pick uh, this week is three different videos uh, about the Boston Dynamics robots. Uh, it just represents uh, the latest rabbit hole that I went down. Uh, one of them actually is uh, by uh, not Boston Dynamics itself, but some other sort of tech video testing, uh, sort of like wired type uh, mm outfit that show how uh, the 
robot called Spotworks. This robot is a four-legged thing that <laughs> resembles a dog, okay? And it goes through a lot of fascinating things about how it works. Another one about how uh, the Atlas robot works. The Atlas robot is the one that uh, looks very human. And I didn't realize this before, but that is uh, strictly a research tool. They, they are not developing this robot to perform any particular uh, function, okay? But rather just as a research tool. And uh, it's uh, uh, really a nice video. Uh, among other things, it has a few outtakes, okay? You always see the videos of the robots performing perfectly. And this has got them falling over and <laughs> and, and spewing hydraulic fuel fu uh, fluid all over the place. And stuff. So that's cool. pretty good. And the last one is, is one of these sort of polished ones that has two of these Atlas robots doing a parkour course uh, together. So just Great. for your amusement, I think these robots are fantastic. The partners in parkour video is really fun. Yeah, it's very good. And they're so so lifelike. I, they must have some, I don't know, there's a, there's a discipline, is there not, on, you know, human movement, is it? Uh, mm -hmm. And they must have some of these individuals working for them because uh, the, the movements of these things uh, uh, mimic humans almost exactly. Really interesting. Well, uh, my pick is actually a bit related so my pick is Lex Friedman, who his website, um, and he's the reason I went to, to Austin this week because he has a podcast called the Lex Friedman Podcast, and uh, he interviews all kinds of interesting people. Um, he's also a, a buddy of um, Joe Rogan, who's a very well-known podcaster, and uh, he, he told me that uh, did you? I don't know if you knew this, but Trump asked Rogan three times to be on his podcast. And Rogan turned him down every time because he, he had to go to the White House and he didn't want to go to the White House. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's not Lex Friedman. Lex is a professor at MIT. He just moved to Austin because he is, he's an AI researcher, artificial intelligence. And he works on uh, autonomous vehicles. He works with, the comp with companies on that. And he's uh, he's designing robots. In fact, I I went to his house for the podcast, where his which is where he records them, and there are little robots all all over the place that he's uh, working on. And his goal is he's he the reason he went to Austin is to start a company to build robots. And he says one day everybody's going to have one in their home. I don't know how long that's going to be, but uh, he's a pretty interesting guy. So uh, my my episode should be up soon. It was four hours, folks. You complain about Twiv. All of, his, <laughs> all of his are three to four hours. I asked him, hey, do people complain? Because people complain to us that Twiv is too long. He says, no, never. Nobody complains. But the check, he's got some really interesting guests. Um, Richard Dawkins, Noam Chomsky, Roger Penrose, Sean Carroll. A lot of interesting people. It's very cool. Yep. So... Uh, Check that out, Lex, uh, Lex Friedman. Really interesting guy. You, did they? Did you actually talk for four hours, Vincent? You think I can't? <laughs> I, didn't say that. But, I mean, um, yeah, give I did. Us the thread. We can hear it, of course. But you know, how about an executive summary of? You gave an entire virology course. <laughs> well, no, we talked for four hours. I got there at eleven, and I was done at three. That's incredible. And he didn't, I mean, I broke to go to the bathroom, but he didn't offer me any lunch or anything. <laughs> I mean, Not he got a pet robot to take home. No, he got up and he, he got a, one of those energy drinks out of the fridge. But yeah, I, had, I can imagine. I had a bottle of water. No, I was fine. I, I mean, he, we talked about viruses, basically. Um, gotcha. You know, some general stuff, some SARS CoV 2 specific stuff we talked a lot about. You know, where the virus came from, vaccines, uh, antivirals. So, and we didn't have any problem. Um, and then the last question he asked me was, and it's a, he asks everyone, he said, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> and my answer was, there is no meaning. It is just a random event that happened and everybody needs to make the best of it because it's all random. James Taylor answered that question very nicely. What did he say? The meaning of life is enjoying the passage of time. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's good. That's it. 
Uh, anyway, That's weird, though. We but, never do. No. We're always either <laughs> looking at what we did in the past or no, waiting or saying, oh, I want to get over right. this so I can get to the next phase. You know, you, you, you're, yeah. I see sure. your nose getting longer because I see you two sitting next to each other and you're still smiling with each other. <laughs> You've had children together. You're married. You're working at the same university in the same laboratory and you, you haven't ended up um, – as a front page news item on some uh, rag sheet. I mean, you're yes. doing great. You're doing fabulous. And yes. You are enjoying the passage of time. Stop. Don't do anything else. What you're doing now, just keep doing it. We yeah. love, we love you. visiting with you, by the way. We really do. Yeah. Likewise. Likewise. Do you, you guys have anything to share? You don't have to, but just ask. I'm him. afraid I neglected. Okay, to no, worries. Find a no worries. No worries. I do. I have. I will have to send it to you. There is a video I found on um, on uh, Twitter, and I've recently started following the guys. The guy does. I forget his name right now, but he does um, special effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so he makes his short videos where he changes himself into various objects. <laughs> and it's uh, the trick cool. he has other videos where he explains how he does it but when you see the collection of the videos for the first time they're really amazing I mean this, this is really uh, very very good at uh, cool. what he yeah. does and please, uh, please send it to really me good. please send it yeah, to I me will. Oh, we have two listener picks one is from Selvi hello beloved Twivers just listening to Twiv 794 in which Diction mentions the wonderful ornithology lab at Cornell to add to that point thought you might be interested to know that the Cornell Ornithology Lab has a fantastic app for birding called Merlin. I started using the app during the lockdown when there was nothing to do except go outside and enjoy nature. You can use it to ID birds, you see, and each time you identify a bird, it saves it to your life list. It's taught me so much about the local birds. It makes me going, makes going on walks and hikes feel a bit of a real, real world Pokemon Go type of game. <laughs> I highly encourage you to check it out. Now I must return to addressing reviewer comments on my latest manuscript. Selvi's a postdoc at UCLA. That's cool. I have to get that. Uh, because there's one that was a pick here some time ago for plants, right? You could point it at a plant and it will tell you what it is. And I, I would love to do that for birds. Uh, then we have Linda who writes, Hello, Twivmeisters from Smoky Seattle where it is currently 72F, 22C with a predicted high of 90F. I hope you enjoy this amazing video, which has a collaboration with molecular biologist Arthur Olson in involving a synthetic polio particle at 37 minutes, 17 seconds. It's a YouTube link. The Royal Institution in this video in particular is so cool. Art Olson, I knew from polio days for sure. I love TWIV and Amy on Q&A with A and V and have been interested in viruses since the first Ebola outbreak. I am just a retired early childhood educator, but the facility I worked at was for a large pharmaceutical company. Parents were happy to chat at the end of the day, and I was just so fascinated. I hope to visit the Incubator, a live audience show, and also to attend the World Science Festival. Both are on my bucket list, fingers crossed. Also, thanks to Alan for the Terry Pratchett reference many twivs ago. I have enjoyed several of his books since then. Deep respect for all you do, and don't let the minority of internet trolls get you down. There will always be 30% of any demographic that rain on others' parades. It's all about <laughs> them, not you, Linda. It's great. All right, TWIV 796. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have any questions or comments, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy what we do, please consider supporting us. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guests today from the Rockefeller University, Paul B. Nash, thanks so much for joining us. Very nice to be with you. I enjoyed it. And Theodora Hatsuanu, good to see you again. Very good to see you too, all of you. And, and uh, enjoy your little break next week, right? Thank yeah. you. Yes, the first since the pandemic started. All right. So <laughs> Good, enjoy. Dixon de Palmier is at triclinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thanks, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Good show. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's a, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> Fair enough. Always a good time. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Theodora. Always great to be with you. Indeed. 
Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. And thanks, Paul and Theodora. Now I'm going to go back to my syllabus and change everything I'm going to say about these. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Real time. Real time. It's good. I'm Vincent Rackinello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>